So for the tangential of the zygomatic arches, uh, the wording in the textbook gets a little bit confusing. So uh, um, I wanted to, to start a new video and, and kind of go through that. If you look on page 77, you see the tangi tangential projection. We use the tangential whenever uh, the SMV just doesn't show us what we need to see. Um, in a lot of cases, if even if the patient's anatomy is normal, they don't have a big head, uh, if they've got a depressed fracture, in some cases you just can't see the fracture all that well. So um, we use tangential. Tangential again means skimming of the surface. Uh, so again, this can be done tabletop. It does not have to be um, in the bucky. It can be done tabletop with uh, a lot of collimation so that there's almost no radiation exposure uh, except for, you know, a, maybe a three by three, uh, three inch by three inch area. But I wanted to point out a, a couple of things that uh, seem confusing in the textbook. So if you look on page 77, you're, you're looking at the position of the part and it says it hyperextend the patient's neck and rest the head on its vertex. Adjust the position of the patient's head so that the IOML is as parallel as possible to to the plane of the image receptor. And this is where it goes off the rails. Rotate the mid-sagittal plane of the head approximately 15 degrees toward the side being examined. Tilt the top of the head approximately 15 degrees away from the side being examined. All right, so they changed the, uh, the point of reference about midway through this, all right, so what it's saying to do is position like an SMV, and you notice you can't see the zygomatic arches whenever I position like so. So what it's saying to do is rotate the head 15 degrees towards the side of interest, like that. And then you're gonna take the top of the head, the vertex of the skull, and you're gonna rotate it away from the side of interest. So side of interest is gonna be over here, so you're gonna tilt essentially the anatomy of interest towards the image receptor and the zygomatic arch appears like that. Um, full disclosure, I really don't understand what the point to, to rotate in the head is, honestly. It, uh, it, it's a step that, that doesn't really give you a whole lot. It puts the anatomy uh, not really parallel to the, to the plane of the image receptor, so you're gonna have to turn your collimator housing uh, as opposed to just tilting the head gives you the exact same thing without the complication of rotating the head um, and putting the anatomy at, at some weird angulation on the, the image receptor. So in clinical practice, you know, know the, the textbook positioning, but in clinical practice, I don't ever rotate the head and tilt. All I do is tilt the head. Now notice that you don't see um, both zygomatic arches in doing that. You only see one, so your central ray should just be through that zygomatic arch and collimated down to include the soft tissue on both sides, anterior and posterior. So a very small collimated area, can be done tabletop, should be done tabletop. Uh, the technique is like a finger technique, uh, very, very low radiation exposure. So, uh, the final view of the zygomatic arches will be at Towns, and it's uh, a little bit of modified Towns. Positioning wise, it's identical. Uh, OML is perpendicular to the image receptor, um, and uh, the, uh, you can use the IOML just to increase the central ray angulation. Really, the only difference here is going to be central ray location and collimation. So, um, your central ray is going to be one inch above the nasion. Um, 30 degrees to the, to the OML, 37 to the IOML, um, and uh, what you're hoping to do is to, uh, to visualize the, the zygomatic arches, which you didn't really see in a Towns for the skull. And the reason for that is because the amount of tissue that you're penetrating for the Towns of the skull is quite great. So you're coming in vertex, or not really vertex, but glabella, and you're penetrating through the entire skull. Uh, for, the, uh, for the zygomatic arches, you're going in a little bit lower, so about halfway uh, to the nasion, and you're gonna exit 
uh, you're also going to penetrate the C spot. So you're still penetrating a lot of tissue. Um, so what I recommend that you do to make sure that you don't overexpose and burn out the zygomatic arches, uh, burn out the zygomatic arches, you're penetrating through a lot of tissue. What you probably want to do is drop your exposure back to a minus one or a minus two density to try to reduce the exposure. Your computer algorithm is really going to be what's going to control your density on that. And hopefully your, uh, your computer algorithm is set up to compensate for that. But even if it isn't, you don't need that much exposure to the patient to demonstrate the zygomatic arches. You're going to be penetrating enough stuff that you shouldn't be shooting this tabletop, but you don't need the same exposure as if you're, you're looking for the, uh, the base of the skull. So what we're going to see is that. And what you see uh, here kind of takes us into the next section with TMJs. Uh, you see the zygomatic arches. Uh, basically what you're doing is you're projecting the, the fat part of the skull and the, the uh, facial bones separate from each other. You see how long the, the, uh, um, the mandible looks. But what you can see is in the mandible, this vertical line right there is actually the ramus of the mandible. It's the vertical portion of the mandible. Uh, whenever we're talking about TMJs here in a bit, um, this one of the views that we're going to use for the TMJs is, is a, a variation of the talons. It's going to be the 35 degree talons instead of the 30 degree talons, but it's a variation of the talons. Uh, same positioning, a little bit steeper of an angulation, and it, uh, the purpose is to, to try to see the, the TMJs a little bit better. So we're going to press on into nasal bones, mandible TMJs. So uh, nasal bones, we talked about those in the anatomy. Um, they're very small, uh, form the bridge of the nose, uh, attach the frontal nasal suture, uh, form the nasion, all that stuff. So the mandible itself is, is the largest and densest bone of the face. Um, the, uh, it's curved bone, so and it's got a lot of different projections on it, but since it is a curved bone, um, if we have a fracture in one place, we're going to have multiple fractures. We're going to have a fracture in at least two places anytime we have a mandibular fracture. So, uh, body being the horizontal portion, um, the body is this portion. The ramus is the vertical portion. Um, and on the, the, uh, the ramus, we've actually got a couple of different things. Um, the, uh, the gonion is the angle of the mandible right there. It's where the body and the ramus come into contact with each other, where, where you go from horizontal to the vertical portion. Um, the middle protuberance is the, the front of the mandible where the, you know, your chin is, the, the front of your chin. So your symphysis is a fusion of both sides of the mandible at the symphysis, and the symphysis is, is where your middle point is. So, uh, you've got alveolar processes, that's uh, the process for the teeth. You've got mental foramen here and here. You've got a coronoid process, and that's this pointy thing right here. You've got condylar processes, and that's what articulates with the mandibular fossa in the temporal bone. That's what forms your temporal mandibular joint. You got a mandibular notch, which is this notch in between the two. All right. So again, you got middle point at the symphysis. You got body. You got the foramina, alveolar processes. You got the body. You got the foramus. You got the the uh, um, angle of the mandible or the gonion. Um, you've got the mandibular notch, coronoid process, and then you've got the condylar process. All looks like that. Temporal bone, um, we talked about temporal bone before. Uh, really only, the only significance here is that the uh, mandibular fossa is where, where the, uh, the condyle articulates so that, that you fit rotation whenever you open and close your mouth. So that is just anterior to your EAM. EAM is right here, and the mandibular fossa is right there. At your TMJ. Okay, so the hyoid bone is um, 
it's, it's not significant for us, uh, for, for our lecture. So just running through it real quick. It's just small bone, it's anchor of the tongue. Uh, it has no bony articulation. Um, it's got ligamentous attachments that uh, hold it in place, but uh, as far as imaging goes, we, we just don't do anything with it. So the mandible, uh, we've got a few things. There's one that's not on here that's in your textbook that we'll talk about. We've got uh, the PA for the ramus, the PA axial for the ramus. Positioning for those two are identical. It's just one has a, a central triangulation. Uh, we do have a PA for the body that's positioned kind of like 55 waters. The PA and PA axial positioning wise are just like PA of the skull, uh, central ray location, collimation, and obviously angulation on PA axial are the only differences. Um, the uh, uh, PA for the body is, is just like a, 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 a 55 waters, and then we'll talk about the, the axial lateral and axial lateral obliques. So again, the PA and the PA axial are positioned like a call well, um, and the PA, since it's not an axial, it's like a zero degree call well. Um, Central ray location, collimation, are, and uh, the structure shown are the only differences. Um, and where you see this is on page 81 in your textbook. So forehead and chin up against the image receptor, or forehead, and, you gotta have to have no nose. Uh, forehead and nose up against the image receptor. Uh, patient upright, patient laying down, doesn't really matter. Recommend laying down. Patient's got a broken jaw, they may be a little woozy. So, orbitomiate line should be perpendicular to the image receptor and mid sagittal plane perpendicular as well. So, your central ray in this case, instead of exiting at the uh, nasion, is going to exit at the acantheon because the only thing that you're looking for is the, the ramus of the mantle. So you want to see the entire mandible, but what you're mainly looking at is the ramus of the mandible. You put the ramus of the mandible parallel to the image receptor so that you don't have any kind of uh, distortion of, of the ramus of the mandible. Notice though that the TMJ is uh, higher and the, actually the condyle and a portion of the ramus of the mandible is tucked away underneath the mastoid process. The whole purpose for the PA axial is to get up under that in order to visualize more of the, um, the proximal end or the, the superior end of the, the condyle kind of process. So what we're going to do is we're going to position exactly the same as PA, but what we're going to do is we're going to angle the central ray 20 to 25 degrees cephalic exits at, at the exact same place and the only thing that we're going to see is just slightly more you know if, if we're in PA then we're going to see from here down if we're in a 25 degree angulation we just gained ourselves about half an inch of, of the uh, uh, condylar process of the, the mandible uh, so we see a little bit more of it not significant but it could make the diagnosis um, make the difference between diagnosis and not so 20, 25 degree angulation positioning is identical. Got a pretty nasty fracture here. Uh, I don't see where the secondary fracture is. Um, just don't see it. So uh, we know that there is one somewhere. Uh, there should be a, a second fracture line somewhere in that image, but uh, it may be in the condyle itself. We just can't see it because it's positioned behind the uh, mastoid process. Okay, so a uh, very slight difference between the two, uh, just not a, not a whole lot of difference between them. So uh, the axial lateral and axial lateral oblique, remembering the axial lateral just means um, a uh, central ray angulation. On the lateral, uh, axial lateral oblique means that the head is turned as well. So Schuler's is, is our axial lateral. It used to be called Schuler's in the book, not to be confused with Schuler's, the SMB Schuler's. Schuler's in the book three or four times. Uh, busy guy. So uh, axial lateral is just a, a lateral, but with central ray angulation. Oblique um, is still lateral, but uh, axial lateral oblique would be with the, uh, the head lateral in a bit of oblique, most, mostly lateral, but in a bit of oblique with the central ray angulation. All right, so um, 
the uh, axial lateral, axial lateral oblique for the mandible, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put the anatomy of interest par as parallel to the image receptor as possible. So if we're looking for the ramus of the mandible, the ramus of the mandible is fairly lateral, so we're going to put the patient in a true lateral position, like so. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, angle the central ray in order to desuperimpose the two. We'll take a look at that here in a minute. But if we're looking at the body of the mandible, the body of the mandible, unless you've got somebody who's got a big square mandible, uh, the body of the mandible is at about a 30 degree oblique. It, it points inward. So if we're shooting for the ramus of the mandible, we're going to put the patient in a true lateral position. If we're looking for the body of the, the, uh, the mandible, we're going to oblique towards the side of interest. So we're looking at the side closest to the image receptor. We're going to oblique towards the side of interest, 30 degrees. If we're looking for the symphysis, we shoot PA, but we're going to have the C-spine directly over it. You're not going to see much anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to oblique 45 degrees for the, the uh, symphysis. Parallel, true lateral, ramus, 30 degrees for the, uh, the body, 45 degrees for the symphysis. And the whole purpose there, what we're trying to do is put the anatomy of interest as parallel to the image receptor as feasible. All right, so this is on page 85. So what we're gonna do in addition to that is we're gonna angle our central ray 25 degrees cephalic. So in just a, a lateral position, like so, um, your ramus should be superimposed and your condyle should be superimposed. With a, 40, uh, a 25 degree cephalic angulation, what you're gonna do is you're gonna project the upside ramus above the downside ramus. Okay, so you get separation vertically like that so you can see the ramus of the mandible. You might have some superimposition of the, the uh, coronary process, but the ramus of the mandible should be desuperimposed. Um, if you're looking for the body, again, you're going to oblique towards the image receptor, 15, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 30 degrees, and then you're going to angle uh, 25 degrees cephalic, and it's going to separate them like that. If you're looking for the symphysis, it's going to be a 45 degree oblique um, with the, the same 25 degrees cephalic central ray angulation. You can shoot these tabletop as well. You're looking for a relatively thin bone, even though it's very dense. Um, it's not all that thick, you know, I mean, it's not real thick bone and you're not shooting through a, a significant amount of soft tissue. You could shoot these uh, tabletop. Now, I want you to back up to page 83. Um, the PA projection for the body is, is what you're looking at there. Uh, positioning here, again, is, is basically like your 55 waters. So your nose and your chin would be on the image receptor. Central ray come, uh, should come right in between the, the ramus of the mandible. And it's, uh, the, the purpose is to try to put the, the uh, to try to put the, the body of the mandible as parallel to the image receptor as possible. So some hospitals have that in their protocol. All right. Okay, so it looks like that. Um, you know, it says it's uh, axial lateral oblique for the uh, mandible, or for the, uh, the body of the mandible. This I don't really get. It says it's axial lateral oblique for the ramus of the mandible. You don't do axial lateral oblique for the, the ramus of the mandible. And I don't know how that made it into the, uh, into the Merrill's. Uh, they had to have used about a 35 degree angulation on that. It's hideous. Synthesis. So, uh, TMJs. The TMJs, what we're gonna do is um, it's kind of a functional test. So we've got a couple of different projections we're going to shoot, actually three. We've got a, an AP axial and we've got uh, an axial lateral and an axial lateral oblique. Um, and what we're going to do on these is we're going to do for uh, every view that we do, we're going to shoot two. We're going to shoot one with an open and one with a closed mouth. All right. So when you open and close your mouth, you can feel on both sides of your head 
uh, just anterior to your EAM and put your hands on either side and just a little bit of opening of the mouth you can feel what's going on with your TMJ. It rotates inferiorly and anteriorly. It basically dislocates whenever you open your mouth. All right. So uh, most of your TMJs are going to be visualized in CT, realistically. But if you ever have to shoot them in the department, you're going to have to shoot every view that you shoot at the TMJ to open and close mouth. All right. So AP axial TMJ is basically your towns. All right. So your body position is going to be exactly the same is what it was with the towns. Um, OML perpendicular to the image receptor, um, the uh, uh, central ray in this case though is going to be slightly different. It's going to be a 35 degree caudal angulation entering three inches above the nasion uh, and it should be centered right between the TMJs. So um, you know the, the angulation is increased and because of that, you know, it would seem like, well, I'm just shooting for the TMJs. I'm not really shooting for the base of the skull. Uh, so why so high? Well, part of that is because you increased your angulation to 35 degrees as opposed to 30 degrees for the normal towns. All right, so that's what we should see. You don't see it all that well uh, up here, but if you look on page 90, I'll kind of point out what it is that you're supposed to be looking at. Um, but in your textbook, if you follow this line up from the ramus, you can see the entire condylar process, the, the most superior portion of the condyle uh, below the mastoid processes. With mouth closed, you can't. So that's closed mouth, that's open mouth. That's why we do uh, TMJs. So, uh, we'll walk through what uh, axial lateral versus axial lateral oblique is. Axial lateral just means uh, an angulation of the lateral. Axial lateral oblique means the same thing, only now you've got a, uh, um, a an angulation on the head as well. All right, so axial lateral TMJs used to be called Schuler's. So this is in addition to, to what Schuler's did with the the uh, SMV. Is Schuler's method as well. So same guy, different projection. Um, so axial lateral means lateral with central ray angulation. Um, so we're going to have a patient uh, laying down or upright. We're going to shoot two again because we're looking for TMJs. We're going to shoot one with mouth open, and unless it's contraindicated, you know, the patient can do this if they've got their wire mouth, their, their mouth wired shut because they got a broken jaw. Obviously, you're not going to do open and closed mouth. But if possible, you're going to shoot open and closed mouth on all of your TMJs. Oops. All right. So axial lateral oblique. This used to be referred to as the law method. And we'll, we'll talk about why we, we do different things here in a bit. So axial lateral obliques, axial lateral. Um, You've got an angulation on lateral, but we're also going to oblique the head a little bit. So it's kind of lateral, mostly lateral, but we're going to oblique the head too. So again, unless contraindicated, we're going to shoot one with mouth open and one with mouth closed. All right. So on your Schuler's, uh, this is on page 91. If you remember back to the skull lecture, uh, all of the bones of the skull had special features except for Parietal bone. All right, so if you shot your TMJs with a patient truly in a lateral position, you would see both TMJs superimposed on top of each other. It'd be difficult to make a diagnosis, more difficult to make a diagnosis where the pathology is. So you got to separate them somehow or another. So um, if we put the patient's skull into a lateral position, we angle cephalic then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take uh, the C-spine, hy hyoid bone, and everything else, we're gonna project it down onto, or project it really up onto the downside TMJ. We don't wanna do that. The one cranial bone that had no real features was the parietal bone. It's, ins <laughs> it's not insignificant, it's, uh, 
it just doesn't have any features. It's just a big square bone. It's, it's got a ridge there, but the ridge doesn't really, it's, it's not appreciably thicker than any other portion of the bone. So it's featureless. So what we're gonna do is instead of angling cephalic and projecting our C-spine onto our uh, downside TMJ, we're gonna angle caudally and project our parietal bone, our featureless parietal bone onto the downside TMJ. Okay, that's our Schuler's, Schuler's method. So uh, angle the central ray 30 degrees caught at um, for the Schuler's. Uh, uh, that's axial lateral. The axial lateral oblique, which is your law method, law method being on uh, page 93, what we're gonna do with the law method is we're gonna use um, two angulations. So what we're gonna do with the law is we're gonna take the mandible, the head, the entire head, and we're gonna oblique it 15 degrees towards the image receptor. And you can see what happened with collar processes there, right? Uh, in a true lateral, they're superimposed with 15 degree uh, oblique, they desuperimpose anterior and posterior, like that. All right, so we've got desuperimposition there. And then what we're gonna do, again, we're on page uh, 93 here, we're gonna angle the central ray 15 degrees caudally, okay? So what that's effectively gonna do is it's, we've, we've already got separation anterior to posterior because we've got an oblique. With the axial lateral, what that's gonna do is gonna separate superior to inferior. So on the test, what you're gonna look for are a number of different things. Axial lateral, shoulders. Um, single angulation, shoulders. Um, law is always gonna be 15-15. Uh, 15 degree oblique uh, with a 15 degree follow angulation. Um, so how you can accomplish the laws in one of three three different ways. I demonstrated one just a second ago. You can take the patient, you know, if, if you find yourself working in a, a hospital where the machine is uh, difficult to move, maybe you're working on an older unit that does tomo and the tube itself doesn't move. What you can do is you can angle the patient's head in two different planes to separate those two. Or you can oblique the patient's head and use the central ray angulation to separate the two, right? So that's two ways. Or the third way is you could use a double angulation on the central ray. Really don't recommend the double angulation on the central ray because um, there's no way to use a grid. Since we're penetrating so much material, most of it being soft tissue, you really kind of need a grid for this, uh, but uh, there's really no way to, to orient the grid that you wouldn't have grid cut off. So you're stuck. Um, so you would be stuck using <coughs> direct, <or> not, <coughs> excuse me, not direct exposure, but uh, a non-gridded technique. You create a lot of scatter. So 15-15, law, uh, double tube angle, law, uh, two angulations, law, uh, single angulation, Schuler's, uh, axial lateral, Schuler's, axial lateral oblique, law. Okay? A lot to remember. Each one of those have to be done open and closed mouth unless there's some sort of contraindication. Okay? Uh, so that kind of goes through everything that I just talked about. And that will be your uh, law method. Um, what, you're, what you're seeing there is the collar process. Looks like open mouth there because we've got the mandibular fossa here. Um, yeah. So uh, nasal bones, lateral and nasal bones are pretty unremarkable. You gotta shoot both. Um, so you gotta do both laterals, left lateral, right lateral. Uh, shoot them tabletop, positioning just like lateral of everything else, but your uh, central ray location. It's just going to be distal to the nasion, and uh, you know your your collimated field is going to be about the size of a quarter. Uh, I don't know, half dollar maybe. Very small. Um, so don't blast the the patient's whole head 
uh, just for lateral and nasal bones. So that's what they look like. Uh, again, easily fractured. All right, so we'll leave off there. I'll record uh, sinuses another day. That'll get you through the next two lectures.